для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm here with a man who played a unique and a compelling role in the unknown war against the Germans. In 1941, he was a senior or first lieutenant. Today, he is Marshal of Aviation for Krishna. On June 22nd of 1941, the Germans, in a surprise attack, caught and destroyed more than two-thirds of the Soviet combat aircraft while they were still on the ground. Hitler and his generals felt that this devastating blow would end the war in Russia very shortly. But they were wrong. For the Soviets fought back. They developed new tactics. Slowly, gradually, the balance shifted. Marshal Pokrishkin himself shot down 60 Nazi aircraft in World War II. Now, the highest Russian military award is the golden star of the hero of the Soviet Union. It was awarded to the Marshal three times. And tell me, Marshal, you flew an incredible amount of missions, and yet you've managed to survive. Will you tell us something about your experiences? Вообще, моя мать после войны говорила мне, что я потому выжил, что родился в рубашке. My mother told me I survived because I was born lucky. But of course, it's not the point. I had to fight from the first to the last day of the war. Before the war, I was already a good airman and good at shooting. And during the war, I studied air battle tactics. All that helped me to fight better, to shoot down the Nazi aircraft and come out of it alive. Thank you, Marshal Pakrishkin. And now our story, War in the Air. The summer sky of June 22nd, 1941, over Russia. A brand new battlefield, the dawn of Operation Barbarossa. Its object, the destruction of the Soviet Union. Bombers of three Nazi air fleets, a total of 2,750 aircraft, delivered the airstrike. Their mission was to destroy the Red Air Force on the ground and lay a carpet of steel ahead of the German panzers as they rolled over the border. These same bombers had already laid waste to the cities of Europe. Madrid, Guernica, Barcelona, Rotterdam, London, Liverpool, Coventry.
Now their targets were troops, farms, homes, traffic on the roads, anything that lay in their path and particularly Soviet airfields. Before noon on this first day of the air war, the Nazis destroyed 800 Russian planes on the ground, 400 more in the air. Attacks came as a surprise. Along the entire front of 1,800 miles, the columns of smoke began to rise. In spite of the Germans' numerical superiority, those Soviet fighters that were left rose to the attack. They were slower and less maneuverable than their enemies. But on that first day of the war, several Soviet pilots found a way of overcoming the difference. They flew straight at the Nazi planes and rammed them in midair, like drivers at a demolition derby. Incredibly, sometimes they survived, parachuting down. Even when badly wounded, the Soviet pilots would try to bring their aircraft home. Pilots were available. Planes were badly needed. destroyed over a thousand Soviet planes on the first day of the war, the newspapers in Germany announced a triumph. They were premature. German intelligence had overlooked three factors. The first was the determination and ability of the Soviet pilots. The second was the fact that the cream of the Red Air Force's fighter strength had not been committed in the initial battle. The third was that the Soviet production capability had been underestimated. All this amounted to a major miscalculation. The first Nazis taken prisoner were Luftwaffe pilots. The Russians claimed 200 Nazi planes were shot down that first day. But the air was still full of Germans. Moscow lay ahead. Moscow, the heart of the Soviet Union, the symbol of Russia. Remembering the fate of other cities, Moscow made ready. In less than three weeks, the German army had covered two-thirds of the distance to the capital. The pattern was familiar. First the Blitzkrieg, then the massacre of cities from the air. But the air war in Russia was not like that in the West. Moscow was savagely attacked but because it was so vigorously defended, no real damage was inflicted. The air war in Russia was fiercest over the battlefields, but there were times when the people of Moscow felt themselves in the front line.
Like the citizens of London, the Muscovites adapted themselves to life underground. On the 46th night of the war, Nazi bombers came again to Moscow. The night fighters met them. Below, the women passed around pictures of their husbands and sons, remembering and hoping. That night, one of the sons rammed a German bomber in the sky above Moscow. He was the first Soviet night fighter pilot to do it. His name, Second Lieutenant Viktor Talalikin. He lived to tell his story. A machine gun burst hit me in the arm. I decided to sacrifice myself, but to down the German first. So I gunned my engine and crashed my plane at full speed into his tail. I was in the air raid shelter listening to the radio. I heard Comrade Talalichin rammed an enemy plane. I was frightened. I said it was my son Vic. I was afraid he'd been killed. Everybody tried to comfort me, and then after a while, Victor came home. He said, you see, I came back alive. Two and a half months later, Lieutenant Victor Talalikin was surprised by nine Messerschmitts. The odds were too great. Those who died were mourned like brothers. Друзья, не стало среди нас товарищей. Friends, we've lost a comrade, a friend in battle. He brought his plane back. He came home to us to die. Весь израненный, он привел ее на свой аэродром. С нами он жил, ребята, и к нам умирать прилетел. Sons, husbands, boyfriends went to the front. Slowly, the Red Air Force built up its strength. There were plenty of young, eager pilots but the planes they needed were in short supply. The night of August 8, 1941, an advanced air base on Sarima Island in the Baltic Sea. of Soviet bombers a very dangerous mission, a raid on Berlin. The object was to show the Germans that their cities were not invulnerable, 
and the Russians that they had the power to strike back. was heavy, even at the front line. Four days earlier, Goebbels had declared that no Russian plane would ever fly over Berlin. Goebbels attributed the raid to 150 British bombers, but the rubble was Russian work. It had been a forlorn hope, and it had been a success. It was the first time Berlin heard the roar of Soviet aircraft. It would not be the last. There is a saying that when the guns speak, the muses are silent. But in Russia, even pianists served at the front. required an oath of its pilots. Motherland, we solemnly swear to you to spare neither effort nor blood nor our very lives in the fight against the enemy. By October 5, 1941, the official figures of Soviet losses total 5,136 planes. The total for the end of that first year was estimated by foreign observers at 8,000. That left about 2,000 planes operational, many of them inferior in performance. Though forced on the defensive, the Soviet pilots kept up the battle until reinforcements could join them. Some flew as many as eight missions a day. Far to the rear, the Red Air Force was training new pilots and ground crews. 40,000 in the first 18 months of the war. And behind them, the factories were turning out the planes they would fly. New models in greater and greater numbers. In six months, Soviet production of three superior fighters quintupled. Far from being annihilated, the Red Air Force was steadily growing into a giant.
women volunteered for the Air Force, in spite of the difficulties of qualifying. Soon there were several women's units in the Red Air Force. This wing became famous as the Taman Guards, an honor they earned in the battles of Stalingrad and Kursk. They flew a remarkable plane, the Polycarpath PO2. Designed in 1927 as a trainer, the PO2 was used as a crop duster, air ambulance, light transport, artillery spotter, and loudspeaker plane. The women's squadrons flew the PO2 as a night bomber. It had an airspeed of 98 miles an hour. Pilots were 19 or 20, most of them college students who had joined the Air Force straight from the classroom. squadrons faced plenty of skepticism until they went into action. At times they flew two or three missions a night, and as many as six when they had to. In their slow-moving little planes, the women were easy targets, but they still braved the night skies. They won their wings many times over, at mortal cost. later, a star in the galaxy was named after one of the women. So their memory lives on in the skies they mastered. Modern fighters began to come off the line in great numbers. The Soviet designers were among the best in the world. Yakovlev. 
Lavochkin. And Ilyushin. The Red Air Force got new fighters, ground-attacked aircraft, bombers that were superior in performance to the Messerschmitts, the Folkwulfs, and the Dorniers the Nazis flew. Among them was the Aleutian Sturmivik, the flying tank. Its entire forward fuselage was an armored box, and the effect of its cannon was devastating. The workers often slept beside the machines they were building. In the first 18 months of the war, they turned out 13,000 more planes than the Germans. Across Russia, people subscribe to the effort. The fuselages of the planes carry the names of their donors, some individuals, many organizations, boys in trade schools, workers in collective farms and munition plants. Even the Mali Theater Group, Russia's leading company, Throughout 1942, the Soviets built up their air fleets. The Red Air Force Command, led by Marshal Alexander Novikov, concentrated on support for the Soviet ground forces, not on saturation bombing of German cities. In 1943, after the Battle of Stalingrad, the air over the battlefields was no longer a German province. For the first time, the Red Air Force contested the Luftwaffe on almost equal terms. In the Kuban in the spring of 1943, and at Kursk in the summer, the Sturmovik's cannons and rockets opened up the German panzers as if they were tin cans. The air war in the East was different in another way, a tragic way. Unlike American and British pilots, the Russian bomber crews were flying over their own land. The Russian bombardiers pinpointed their own cities, roads, farms, homesteads. Summer of 1943, while the battle surged across the plains of Russia, unprecedented in its ferocity, the Germans received what they had been accustomed to handing out. Whether in attack or in retreat, the Wehrmacht learned what it was like to be harried constantly from the air.
Luftwaffe encountered one of its own tactics, the fighter swarm. As the Red Army moved to the offensive, the Red Air Force more and more denied its enemies the advantage of air power. began to produce its own heroes. A victory is celebrated. First mission, first kill. A moment of glory for a 19-year-old. First, captured Nazi pilots had been something of a curiosity for the Russians. Later, they became a familiar sight. By the end of 1944, the Russians had accounted for over 20,000 German pilots. The Luftwaffe was drained. Life for Russian pilots was much the same as it was on any airfield. Periods of intense, lethal activity. Periods of calm. A life of extremes that very often only the young could endure. shop talk the world over wherever the location there were two of them one of them rolled into a dive the other turned away I was faster so I got one in my sights and blasted him when I looked again he was in flames but then I looked behind me and there was a fox wolf on my tail Nearly 200,000 pilots were given awards for valor. 2,420 of them became heroes of the Soviet Union, the equivalent of the Medal of Honor. Soviet President Mikhail Kalinin presented some of the medals in the Kremlin. More often, the pilots receive them besides their aircraft on the combat fields. And sometimes the awards were a mother's only consolation. Some of the recipients were Frenchmen fighting in the Soviet Union. Early in the war, a French squadron was formed on Russian soil to fight alongside the Red Air Force. After the fall of France, they had been men without a country. The Russians gave them planes and a cause. They called themselves the Normandy Squadron.
planes were Yak-3 fighters, armed with a 20mm cannon and twin machine guns. The Yaks were superior to the Messerschmitt 109s and the Folkwolf 190s of the Luftwaffe. The planes of the Normandy squadron were maintained by Soviet ground crews. The relationship between the French pilots and their Russian mechanics became very close. Maurice Fassin was one of the pilots. Ivan Belozub, his mechanic. Together they became a legend. Belozub and Fassin flew together only once. When Normandy squadron was transferred to a new airfield, Fassin took Belozub with him for the ride. On the way, they were attacked by Nazi fighters. Belozub had no parachute. Base headquarters ordered Fassin to bail out. He refused. He tried to land the plane to save his Russian friend. Neither survived. As the war went on, more French squadrons were formed, becoming an air regiment with the title of Normandy Neyman. It fought to the end of the war. Then it took its planes home to France, a gift from the Soviets. One of the most formidable of all Soviet fighter pilots was young Alexander Pokrishkin. Pokrishkin became one of the Red Air Force's most famous aces. Among the planes Pokrishkin flew was an American Era Cobra P-39. This was Pakrishkin's 50th kill. Pakrishkin chalked up a total of 60 victories, an ace by any standards. As a lieutenant, he ended it as a regimental commander. Highly successful and very popular. Early in 1945, Pokrishin was made a hero of the Soviet Union for the third time. Pokrishkin came from Novosibirsk, in the center of the Soviet Union. 
Before the war, he had been a worker at the combine factory. So his return as a hero was a cause for celebration. His home was still in Novosibirsk, where his mother and wife lived. His wife had been a nurse and they had married at the front. Now she was expecting their first child. short furlough, like all furloughs, far too short, and like all furloughs, perhaps the last. Krishkin enjoyed a long and distinguished military career. I understand, Marshal, that you were also decorated by the Americans. Would you tell me about that? In 1943, in the Kuban, I flew an American fighter, the Era Cobra. It was a very good aircraft. What I liked best was its armament, a 37mm cannon, two large caliber machine guns, and two regular machine guns. But I connected all of them to one fire button. When you caught a German, you'd approach it this way, and then just press once, and it was all over. It was a good plane, and for my victories in that American plane, the Era Cobra, I was awarded an American decoration in 1943 in the Kuban. During the war, the Allies supplied over 14,000 aircraft to the Red Air Force, including Mustangs and Mitchell medium bombers. But what really turned the tide was the massive Soviet production of first-class designs, 108,000 planes, and the morale of the young Russian pilots. The Red Air Force produced some great commanders. Chief Marshals Vershinin, Novikov, Marshals Rudenko, Krasovsky, Sudets. During the Battle of Moscow, the Russians have been able to put only 1,200 planes in the air. In the Battle of Germany, they fill the skies. War's end, the Soviets claimed a total of 77,000 Nazi planes destroyed. Berlin was littered with the wreckage of the once proud Luftwaffe. Its airfields became Russian playgrounds. It 
all happened a generation ago. День победы, как он был от нас далек, как в костре потухшем таял уголек. But for these veterans of the Red Air Force, it was only yesterday. Этот день мы приближали как могли. Этот день победы. Only yesterday, when the day began, you could not know if you would still be alive when it ended. Only yesterday that they fought in the unknown war, so they could begin life again. Здравствуй, мама. Возвратились мы не все. Посеком мы пробежаться по росе. Пол Европы прошагали пол земли. Этот день мы приближали как могли. Этот день победы. Our next story, The Partisans. Hundreds of thousands of Russian civilians left their burning farms in devastated cities to fight the Nazis as guerrilla groups. They ambushed Nazi units, destroyed communications, carried out all kinds of sabotage. They were the anonymous fighters of the unknown war. <laughs> 